Hello. Uh, we're obviously late in the evening, but I'll try to be efficient yet informative. Uh, I bought a property up in Sonoma that is a fixer, and it has a lot of things wrong with it. Uh, it's a great candidate for me to do some things like IoT. So consumer goods, I'll build my own. And what it really became is what have I gotten myself into? Uh, and that's because if you want this thing to work, you really have to invest the time as if it were a consumer product. So let me give you some of the uh, things that my wife complains about. Oh, I gotta go downstairs and turn the light on. Damn sprinkler doesn't work again. Oh, landscapes went out at 11 and all my friends left at m midnight. They didn't have any lights going out. She wants to know the temperature. My friend Blaine, his boat leaks. If the bilge pump doesn't turn on, he wants to know. And then lastly, the gate always giving out the stupid security code. So these are just some anecdotal things of what I had as problems that I wanted to go off and fix. So some of the projects that I have, I'll go into it in a second, they're all based on the particle core, photon, or electron. If you're familiar with particle, they have a little board that has Wi-Fi on it, and one of them has cellular on it. They have a cloud, you can do posts and gets. They're all based on that. That's how I connected it to the internet. Um, the first one is a light switch, and you might say, I'll just go buy a Belkin Wemo, but I won't say that. So it has to fit in a box. There it is. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about it in a second. The uh, next thing is a version of that same. It's a power brick. Just control the relay. I'm not doing this show and tell too well. Next thing is a sprinkler because literally it's a vacation home. You're not there. The sprinkler doesn't go on. The plants die. So this actually is installed. It runs. Uh, some of the other things, just a temperature sensor. And lastly, the infamous poorly named Boatmon, Boat Monitor. Uh, basically, it just has a bunch of analog circuitry to see if the bilge pump turns on, to see if the GPS draws current or is, if it's stolen, to see if the radar turns on or is stolen, uh, what's the battery, uh, things of that sort. And this would be a particle electron. Uh, so that's going to be a cellular collection, not a Wi-Fi connection, because obviously in the marina, you're not going to have cellular connections. So here's the, uh, yeah, I'll just do a few. It won't just be for you. Either, either that or you're going to get a phone call saying the landscape lights aren't on. Um, the second bullet, you know what? I get the same blame on a remote control, so I'm not sure it's that relevant. <laughs> I'm going to be at fault no matter what. But the most important thing that I had, and I'm an electrical engineer by training many years ago, haven't done it for 30 years, um, is that if you're really going to do it right, there's an awful lot of software you got to know. And this is just some of the tools that I had to learn, because I had never created a web page. I certainly had done electronics and could design boards. But there's a whole slew of things here. Uh, many of you are developers, and you probably go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But for me, this is stuff I didn't know. Um, I, I picked Bootstrap because it has a nice way of presenting uh, pages, jQuery. And you, you might ask yourself and say, well, that's a lot of stuff. How the heck did you learn that? And this is where there was a really superb hidden benefit to this project. <laughs> I literally lost 25 pounds more because I was eating better. But I basically worked out and I watched, you know, 30-hour sessions on JavaScript, 20-hour sessions on... I can't, I don't know about you, I can't work out unless I got something in front of me. I just go, oh, this hurts. Anyway, I spent a lot of time on the treadmill, and that led me to the following products. So this is the light switch, 120 volts. I, what I need inside it is a 120 volts to 5 volt switcher for the particle system. It's got to fit in the box like I showed you. This will be a re relay that controls whatever I'm turning on. The particle cores I already mentioned. Uh, I tried to go with a mechanical switch and it didn't work and then I went capacitive sense and it didn't work and then I went capacitive sense and it did work and I'll show you the hilarity of the mechanical configuration of that. Uh, I wanted an LED because in the garage you don't know if the light's on outside. You need 
and then it had to fit a standard decorus switch over the top. So you might say, how do you go about this? At the, at the bottom line of this, this is no different than blinking an LED. You're flicking on a relay and flicking off a relay. So the actual work is not that complicated. But you do need a switch mode power supply. And if any of you are hardware folk or you <laughs> have the bravery to attack, uh, attack something with 170 volts DC on your board, uh, this is where I went, and TI has a fabulous set of websites and support tools to design power supplies. So this is a $49 module that does 120 volts down to 5 volts at 1 amp. Comes with a complete, I don't know, 15-page data sheet, has the layouts, has the bomb, has everything. So all I had to do, I mean, it isn't all, I had to put it on a board. Now to do that, if you're a hardware guy, gal, you should go and get this Saturn PCB design kit. It's free. And what I show here, and this is an eye chart, so I, I don't know how to do it other than this. These are all of the things this tool will calculate for you. It's free, you download it. And this is an example of, I ha worst case, I have a bare PCB, I have this amount of voltage. What's the minimum clearance between the runs on that board? It says 50, I did 65. How did I do that? Oh, this is another tool. I said I wanted to switch 15 amps. Um, if you look over here, this is the conductor width. Uh, the, ba the total copper width on the board, I actually had it specially made. It actually didn't cost any more than a regular PCB in China with three ounce copper. Usually you have one ounce copper. Anyway, that says there's eight amps allowed on that run. I have a run on the top, a run on the bottom. 16 amps, I'm good. So this is an invaluable tool. In other boards, I have power going through with vias, and it tells you exactly how big you have to make that via. So how do you enforce that? Well, in, I use a set of tools that I'm guaranteeing no one in here uses. <laughs> they were given to me for free, uh, and they come from National Instruments. If you were in college, you might use them. Uh, the schematic capture is multi-SIM, and the, layout, the board layout is ultra-board. Uh, Multi-SIM has a fabulous analog simulator with oscilloscope displays via circuit and all of that. Um, and the PCB layout is fine. Uh, you have to do a lot of footprints because they don't have any, but you can see on this the clearance to trace I set at 65. You can see this trace is highlighted. Every single trace on the board has a limit of how close it has to be to each other run, and the package won't allow me to put it any place that doesn't meet that requirement. So this made uh, layout, if you look at the, I mean, it's not like this is rocket science laying out this board, but the, the magic was in making sure that the runs weren't going to arc across to each other. Uh, again, 170 volts. You can see high voltage, mains voltage. Um, I put this up there only, I mean, I, I don't know how you pronounce, KICAD, KICAD, uh, Eagle, they have this function as well. If you're going to lay out a board, look at the 3D view because you can instantaneously see where you goofed up. Uh, enormous, enormous help. Uh, this is the board that ended up. You'll not be surprised. It's remarkably similar to what was on the 3D view. And again, this is, this is uh, okay, this is a gimme. There's a Wi-Fi chip that connects very easily. This little area here is just a set of transistors to pull in a relay. Nothing big there. A couple of LEDs. Um, and there's the switch mode power supply, the 5 volt caps. Uh, Pi inductor, filter, transformer, um, and a MOSFET. The transformer, I mean, if you choose to do this, <laughs> the guys that sell these transformers, they don't like you because <laughs> how much for 10? They go, what? <laughs> I usually sell 10,000 of these. Anyway, the guy sold me some, so there you go. Um, so the bottom line is this is not a particularly complicated circuit to design because I found resources where I could just do it. The layout here was helped by a tool that could do it. So the next thing becomes, what do you do? It becomes an enclosure issue. Um, and before I get to the enclosure, I'll give you my sad story about capacitive proximity uh, <laughs> sensing. I started off with the switch here that went through the, uh, the front panel, and that actually worked, but it was a little weenie switch. And, that had no cool value, and my son said, I just want to wave in front of it. Okay. <laughs> so on a bench, I put a little piece of metal with a wire, 
and it worked. And I put it into this thing with a wire to there. There's a whole heap of capacitance floating around in there, and it didn't work at all. So I actually ended up having to build a small board with a capacitive sense unit in it, which yielded this incredibly awesome mechanical configuration <laughs> where this, as the next slide I'll show you, this sits on a middle piece that sits on the back piece. So this front piece, breaking all rules of UL compliance, by the way, uh, <laughs> pops off. Um, but I have these installed in my barn, and they're only in my barn because if you put these in your house and it burns down, you don't get your insurance money because you designed it. This clearly isn't going to pass UL testing. It probably would pass FCC testing. Uh, but the point I wanted to make is um, for this product, it really isn't just all about the enclosure. It's all about 170 volts being taken care of carefully. But at the end of the day, it is all about the enclosure. And I used Autodesk Inventor. Um, People use Fusion and other things. If you say you're a student, you get it for free for three years. Okay, and it's the same product that Boeing uses. You can go to Tech Shop, 30 bucks, three hour class, you take three of them. My son did this. You know how to use it. It isn't hard to use. Uh, if I had five minutes, I could design that back box right in front of you. It's not hard to use. And then you just output it in a um, the STL file to Cura and you slice it. So, Again, this, this project was mostly about the, uh, the box. This, you can tell, is the same exact board, and it's just in a power brick. So I can control, uh, I could control my pool equipment, I could control, I could control my landscape lights with it right now. I can control anything, because it, it'll run 15 amps. It has your regular plug over here, and on the other side, uh, an IEC plug that you'd plug into the back of any piece of equipment. Um, it, this is the first one I designed. Obviously, it's not good to have wires kind of jammed into pins. <laughs> so on the real one, it doesn't do that. Uh, but again, on this particular thing, oops, it's all about the enclosure. Now, to, to give you a testament to this, I didn't design this. My son designed it. He went to tech shop. He took three three-hour classes. And uh, again, you, if you've ever done solids modeling, you draw a rectangle, you extrude it. You draw a circle, you extrude a hole into it. It, it really is not hard to do this kind of stuff. So um, if, if that's holding you back, take the classes. You'll know how to do it. It isn't hard at all. As for 3D printing, I have a Type A Machines early days edition. So I don't want to, uh, I probably bought too early. It's an incredibly solid machine. It, mine is really, really finicky. Um, you can have stretches where it just doesn't print for a two, two layers and it's cracky. Uh, this is a two years old. I think the one they have now, it has a heated bed. I think it's a lot better. Uh, but for me, if you're buying a 3D printer and it says 12 by 12 by 12, check around. A 12 by 12 by 12 part would take like 38 hours to run probably. These pieces here each took five hours to run. I mean, they're, they're that long, but anyway. So 3D printing is in, in my book uh, is a little immature, but I did find a solution. And uh, Ninja Flex, if, if you have a problem with 3D printing, is a flexible filament. And it would stick to the bed, and it would never skip. So although it's not as uh, solid as regular PLA, it worked for me. And I guess my, I've, I've used like four different 3D printers and none of them are reliable, so I'm a little jaded on it. So going on to precipitation. This is what my wife named it. Um, I, I have 16 zones in my yard. Again, it's up in Sonoma. I never know if it turns on. I wanted it to run solely from 24 volts, which is what the solenoids for a sprinkler run from. Uh, and I wanted it to be controllable from, you'll see how the feature creep went there. <laughs> Again, I need a switch mode power supply to go from 24 volts to 5 volts. I go to TI, I go to Webbench, um, and literally there's a little dialog box, and you, I would type in literally 20 and 30 as a min max, 5 out, 600 milliamps. 
and I get this, okay? Uh, and again, I'm not jumping between the presentation, I'm just giving you somewhat eye chart uh, kinds of things, but there's the exact schematic, there's the bill of materials, there's the recommended layout. When the tool first comes up, it presents you with about 30 options. It gives you the price of each option. It will allow you to buy every component that's on that list. It gives you the sizes so you can see exactly how much real estate, and it'll tell you how many square millimeters it's gonna take. So I didn't design anything on the switch mode power supply. I, I, I knew where to look. Um, so again, this is just a layout thing. Um, now the sprinkler itself, this is the board. Looks like a lot, but this is the, electric, the particle photon, a couple of 595 shift registers to drive one per zone, switch mode power supply, and then there are 16 identical circuits, eight, one per station that I need to drive. This is an optical isolator and a triac. I got it off the internet on a data sheet. Uh, I mean, I shouldn't denigrate it that much. I was an electrical engineer, I can verify it was a good design and I used it, I should say it that way. And then these are transient uh, voltage suppression diodes uh, in case lightning strikes. So again, putting a 595 onto an Arduino, not very complicated. Switch mode power supply, design easy, layout, make sure you do it right. If you don't lay it out right, it won't work, I can tell you that. Um, but again, to make it easy, again, this is my, the particular tool I have and I'm sure Altium and all of those have this. Uh, there's a group re replica place feature, and all I do is go bink, 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 bink. So this board was really not hard to design at all. Um, and it came down to software more than anything else because I went with a commercial enclosure. Uh, so this is because Wi-Fi never goes as far as they say it goes. Uh, the uh, particle photon actually has an antenna on it, but it wasn't good enough where I put this. Um, and you got to make sure you have some kind of way to get cables in and out. This is clear because there's an LED to show which one is on or if multiple of them are on. It actually could run with every single one of them on electrically, but I doubt that your water pressure would allow that, and I doubt that your transformer, which uh, is this thing, would allow it. Now, this thing is a kind of a bit of a interesting. These are the sizes of most 24 volt transformers. If you've got an outside outlet on your house with a plastic cover, a splash screen cover, is this gonna fit in it? No. <laughs> so this is plugged in inside my house and there's a hole drilled through the house <laughs> to the sprinkler mounted on the wall. But um, it's actually, I mean, it works. Uh, Another point, again, some of these are not related to specifically to this project, but um, if you're building something, surface mount is the only way to go. It isn't that hard to do. Um, you need some paste, and unfortunately the paste has to be refrigerated. You need some really good tweezers. Uh, this is a rig you can probably buy for 150 bucks that you just lay the stencil out, put it down, smear some um, paste on it. I have a reflow oven. I bought this one on eBay. It has an exhaust vent. Most of them don't. It gets pretty smelly if you don't have an exhaust vent. You can see it has a solder profile. You don't need one of these. You could paste boards to the tabletop with a stencil on top. Uh, I think the, one of the important things is, if you're willing to go to China, um, this stencil cost $18 in the aluminum frame. 10 of these boards cost $60. Um, I mean, you can go to Osh, they make good boards too, but. Uh, it, it's relatively easy to, to do this. The, there is one thing about this board that, you know, was a little problematic, and that is that it has 175 components, some of which, many of which are 0603. Um, and when you get to a certain age, <laughs> obviously I don't do that, but... <laughs> Um, this actually, and I, I think I have it at the end, this actually drove me. So I, first of all, I'm retired. I've been retired a couple of years. I have time. So I'm saying stuff that you guys are going, when the hell do you have time? Well, I have time. And because I'm retired and I can buy myself a few presents, I buy myself a few presents. If at the end, if there's time, I'll, I'll show you what made that job really easy. Another thing, if you're building boards that you need to watch out for, and it took me about two months, the first surface mount board I did. 
Uh, this is from Beta Layout. They're a German company that makes boards. They have a lovely website. They do a good job and all that. And this doesn't show very well. This is Sunstone. Um, they charge 100 bucks a board for a little dinky board. And this is a random Chinese supplier. If you want to look for them, it's Bowtech. And just ask for Bow. <laughs> The thing is, if you look here, and I don't know if it shows, there isn't a micron between the pad and the solder mask. There is no solder mask between these. So I spent two months putting TQFP 100s on a board, and it always kind of had these massive solder bridges. And I'm going, I'm such an idiot. I am so incompetent at this. I order a Sunstone board, boom. It works. Well, I don't know if it's worth 100 bucks, but <laughs> the other thing I would suggest, um, the other solution I had is I didn't go with what the manufacturer recommended for pads. I reduced the pad size. I made rounded corners. I made sure I had a 0.4 stencil, not a 0.7 stencil. Less solder applied, less solder to bridge, easy. And I'm, I'm telling you, TQFP100 is a pretty, uh, pretty hairy chip. I, I can put them, on, put them on no problem now placing by hand. Um, and if you want to find some suppliers, there's a website, pzshopper.com. You put in what you want, and it'll show you 30 different, mostly Chinese, suppliers. But it'll show you Bay Circuits down in uh, Fremont. It'll show you a beta layout. You can just look at them. So let me talk about the firmware. <laughs> I started off with a program with hard-coded times and a loop that said, is it 3 a.m.? Run. OK, is it 3.15? That's station one. Run. Um, and it worked famously. It was lovely. Uh, but that didn't seem to be good enough. Uh, I could do over-the-air updates with the particle, so I could change the times and just download another version of the program. It was easy. Um, but there's a lot of different styles of uh, vegetation. So you know, why shouldn't I have five? I'm going to go through this quickly. Five, ten, maybe even 15 programs. There's enough memory for that. But wait, what, I want to test the program. Why don't I have a test routine? Uh, what if I just want to do the palm trees for two hours just one time? I, what if I want to do three of them? <laughs> you could see feature creep here. Uh, of course, I better have excellent reporting. Uh, it needs to be on my phone, my wife's phone, Mario, my landscaper guy's phone. Maybe a web page. Uh, maybe I tweet everything, email. Anyway, uh, I did all this. It was kind of stupid. A lot of time, a lot of learning. Um, one of the first things I debated was where do you put the data? You could put the data in the cloud, uh, I guess. But if the cloud goes down, the sprinkler's dead. You, uh, if you d I'll just cut to the chase. I put it in the sprinkler. And that's because someone on a phone and someone on a web page might be accessing it at different times, and it gets out of sync. So it's, on, it's all stored in the EEPROM of the device, not in the cloud. And if the power goes out, it starts back up, and it knows exactly where it was, because it's all stored in the EEPROM of the device. Now, how do you communicate from the device you're using? Uh, Particle makes it pretty easy. I mean, you, uh, a year ago, I wouldn't have said that this way. You just do a bunch of posts and gets. A year ago, I would mm. Anyway, they aren't that hard to do. Uh, they only allow 63 bytes of data to be sent, however. And a typical name for a station might be at least 30 characters long. Uh, get, you can get a lot more data back. Uh, what this led to is very cryptic messages that you had to manually serialize and deserialize. So these are actual messages to and from, and I actually had to almost create a data sheet. That says program five's name is early morning soak. Program five starts at 2350, 1150 PM, runs every day, and these are the times for each of the stations. This is the status byte that shows every one of the programs. These are the names of the programs. Um, it took a fair amount of time to design this. You couldn't, and again, some of you may be way familiar with this. Some of you may not even know what it is. but most of the stuff on the web is done with this thing called JSON. Well, there's not enough to do it, because 63 bytes I had to send. I mean, I, that's almost 62 bytes. Anyway, um, the uh, publish-subscribe function that comes with Particle, where you can publish an event, 
Uh, any one of your devices can subscribe to that event. It's fabulous. Uh, and they have integration with IFT, as I'll show you. Uh, if this, then that, if you've heard of that. It's a, pro it's a website that allows you to, if you get a text that says this, do that. And uh, it's integrated with the particle, so you can actually control one of these Wi-Fi devices with IFT. Um, so I had to do an Android app. And I could have learned Java and Android Studio, but nah. I'll do training wheels. Um, this is a program, an entire program that controls my gate. Okay, it's an Android program. This is called. This is based on Google work. They passed it to MIT. It's a graphical programming language. I'll zoom in on it in a second. But this is the screen that it results in. It has a little palette area where you drag buttons on, and you can put your own images in. If you click Open Gate now, call this routine. Send a one. Send a two. Send a three. It's really not that uh, sophisticated a setup. And again, this is pretty busy. But you can see ass uh, assembling a, a uh, post with the URL, the parameters, the uh, token and IDs for security. The result comes back. It does the, those bytes that are really busy that I told you come back as those bytes. But they are in the fourth field called result in uh, second key value pair. Anyway, th that's the whole app. It's, anybody can do this. Okay, so if you want to do an, an if, you, if you're an Android person, you can do an app with a particle like that. It's easy. Um, this is the precipitation app. You can see this is this morning. Systems enabled, no stations running. Monday and Thursday soak. We're only allowed to do Monday and Thursday in Saratoga. That's actually where I'm testing it. And these are the stations that are going to run for the rest of the day. Um, so I know what's going on. This is how you set the minutes per station and which days it's going to run when it starts. You can name it. And then this is how you name the stations so that you, instead of, I don't know if any of you have rainbirds, but OK, I'm on program C. And I want it to, uh, I mean, they're arcane. This is trivial to use. Um, and the. Uh, the web page, I mean, that took a lot more time. Um, but at the end of the day, it looks exactly the same. Uh, this uses Bootstrap so that e it'll show up on a phone. Uh, if you're not familiar with Bootstrap, I guess it's Twitter that came up with it. It automatically shrinks the screen attractively as you go down in width of screen. So if I put this up, all of these manage, run once, and reporting would become one of those three line things on the right that you click on um, to see what commands are available to you. Um, Twitter notification, not very hard to put in there. You can see Dragon Flower Bed running once, ended at 7.17 AM. Uh, with IFT, if a tweet happens, it'll send me an email. Um, and obviously, I don't have it do this all the time. Um, you can also have it create a summary of the day at 11 p.m. and just look at one email to see if the sprinkler ran. And again, I put this in because the sprinkler wasn't running and the, the plants were dying. So coming back to what have I gotten myself into? <laughs> Making a connected device, at least with particle, and I've not used electric imp or any of the others, isn't rocket science. The hardware design and the Wi-Fi connection, I think, I hope I've shown you, is relatively easy. Uh, the software probably took me 80% of the time. But if you are a software developer, I'm sure it wouldn't have taken you 80% of the time, because you didn't have to get onto a treadmill to learn about it. Uh, the enclosure uh, is just as important as the PCB. Um, if you can't put something together like this, or you don't have the time to go find a box like this on AliExpress, find these glands. I mean, it's just not functional unless you have time um, to do a proper enclosure. Um, so at the end of the day, <laughs> it, if you're really going to do it right, and I think I did uh, for the function that I wanted the sprinkler to do, it's just a huge amount of work. Um, what I need to do now, if I have the desire, <laughs> is to put moisture sensors on it, to put a temperature sensor on it, to put a flow sensor on it to put a flow sensor on it to see if when it says it turned on, water is actually flowing. More importantly, $1,700 expense. 
uh, to see if it's not supposed to be on and there's water flowing <laughs> to say, whoa, don't do that. Um, and that's, that's basically the summary. And then the, the macular uh, degeneration, there is a solution. Let's see, need glasses for this. <laughs> you buy yourself a toy. <laughs> this is a Neodin 4. Um, I can't tell you the pins and needles I was on figuring I was going to get crap paying a lot of money for it, but it has a downward looking camera um, that allows it to locate where it is. It has an upward looking camera to say, whoa, is that tilted? And uh, the thing placed TQFP 100s right, I should say, right on the money unless you use one of those cheap boards that had the space between it. And then it, every time it put it, the thing landed between it and stayed between it. Um, it might still have landed okay, but it's not briefed up. Right. It, might, it, it would land okay, and then it would. So this thing, I mean, um, it's a topic for another day. But this thing whips. <laughs> so if you don't have solder paste, then it doesn't land properly. The part's going to vibrate off off the pad. Does it apply solder? No, you got to do that with the contraptions that I had. That little fold thing, drag it over, put it on. But I, I can make a board in uh, eleven minutes. Reflow, I mean, put board in to reload. Um, I mean, I will tell you this. You quickly find your favorite 30 components because you don't want to put the stupid reels in. <laughs> you go, oh, no, I'm not using any 20K. I'm putting two 10Ks on the board. <laughs> it was just under $10,000. It was not cheap. <laughs> but when you're retired, you don't buy a Ferrari, you buy a pick and place machine. <laughs> That's why I was sitting on pins and needles because it goes, oh, where the hell is it? Uh, I, so what this really comes down to, if you really look at what I did, yes, I did some electrical engineering, but I really was a uh, junior year manufacturing engineer on a lot of this stuff. Um, but it was fun. It was, uh, and now if I want to, uh, you know, if I want to make 20 of these sprinklers, I can do it in a day, no big deal. Uh, put them on Tindy and, uh, and suffer the consequences of building 20 things where prices cost way too much because you're not buying a thousand of them. Uh, but anyway, that's the, uh, that's the presentation. Any, any questions? Yes, I am. I'm, uh, I have a final version of the board that I'm going to, he asked if I'm going to do that. <laughs> you can laugh. He asked if I'm going to do that. I am. Uh, I have a final version of the board I'm sending off tomorrow and I'm going to make 20 of them. Because uh, I now know, well, I have all the reels mounted. <laughs> <laughs> all I have to do is call, what's her name? Linda. I don't know how they pick their name over in China and show me 20, 20 of those boxes and the glands and uh, please, I'd love to engrave it for you. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to do that. I'm going to put it on, uh, see if I can, it, it won't be cheap. It'll probably end up listing at 199 bucks because uh, it probably cost me without labor 100 bucks in parts. So the question was, did I do a competitive analysis? I looked at Home Depot and the prices for them that do this kind of thing in commercial projects, products that have gone through FCC and that meet UL. This probably would meet UL and all of the standards, by the way, uh, are 199 to 249 and they only do 12 stations. So it's in the, well, I'd be selling it at a two times markup and a normal business would sell it at a four to five times markup. But I'm, like I said, I'm not in this to, I'm not trying to make a um, billion dollars selling it to Google. I'm just goofing off. <laughs> but if they're interested, I'm, I'm in. I'm in. <laughs> and you could make like an eight channel board, which is more than most people buy anyway. You know, four and six is the most common. I, I mean, all I'd have to do is hack off, yeah, hack off like half. two in, an inch and a half of the board, and then it'd be right. small. The relay is probably one of your biggest costs. Well, no, they're well the triax, it's triax, and they're, they're pretty cheap. Yeah. Um, I mean, most of the expenses. 
the transformer, the enclosure, connectors. and connectors. Yeah. It is, it's true. Yeah. Each of those connectors is like a buck. Yeah. It's stupid. What sort of Wi-Fi range was I getting with the light switch? I got, oh, well, I'll, I'll go with this. The sprinkler with the particle antenna, not the, I got about 100 feet outside my house. That's it. Uh, again, for, so for some people, that's plenty. Um, but uh, this place is up in Sonoma in country land. It's on two acres. I barely got to that. That's why I had to put an antenna on it. It just wasn't reliable enough to pick up the signal. Otherwise, I, I guess the question for me is: if you're putting the Wi-Fi antenna right next to you, aren't you contributing to your interference? What do you mean, the Wi-Fi right next to means? I mean, having it, it's like an internet with power. Yes, on the light switch. Uh, I mean, I made a mistake on the board that I would fix if I ever do it again. Uh, I have like five of them, and I don't think I'm going to sell them because I don't want to get sued. Uh, I wouldn't have put a, such a big ground plane underneath it because you need as much area for that antenna to work. Um, but I don't know. It's, it's the, the light switch, I only put it like 60 feet away, and it worked. Um, only through one wall, though. I mean, that's the killer. If it goes through three walls... Anyway, you, you all have Wi-Fi that lasts 10 feet. And as I, I got pointed out, don't really think about security with this. <laughs> this is a vacation home. There's nothing valuable. Uh, so I'm sure someone could hack into my Internet of Things stuff. But anyway. I was just going to ask if you, if you try to correct for some of that in software, and then you have to retry things. And that would be a good idea. The question is whether I would do a software retry uh, to correct, for, you know, try three times. And I didn't do that. I just put an antenna on it. They keep it stupid and simple. So. Okay. Well, thanks. Yeah. Thank